Isaiah chapter 65, that's where we are today. If you'll take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 65 and 66. We're going to close out the book of Isaiah today. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be into Jeremiah, so read ahead. But if you see an usher coming down an aisle near you, that means they might have a Bible or two in hand. And if you need one today, just raise your hand and they will give you what they have. Isaiah chapter 65 is where we will be. That's page 532 in the church Bibles. If you're new here to Cornerstone, first, we want to welcome you. But secondly, this is kind of the style here. On Sundays, we go straight through the Bible, cover to cover, teaching and studying and hopefully living out God's Word. So uh, we will finish Isaiah today and next week head on into Jeremiah. But I'm going to read here from chapter 65, the closing uh, verses from verse 17 down through the end of the chapter. Isaiah 65 and starting at verse 17 down through the end of the chapter. It says, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them, and they will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. They will not toil in vain or bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. But dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. Let's pause there and pray. Lord, it's good to be in your house today. And we thank you for your word. It's powerful effect in our lives if we would hear it and do what it says. And may we be encouraged today as we read these, these closing chapters of Isaiah as we consider the things that are to come. The things that you have in store for us the plans that you have for those who love you. And Lord, may our hearts be stirred with anticipation. And we're mindful, Lord, of other things going on in our world outside the walls of our church, the comfort of our service here this morning. We think about those who have just been devastated by Hurricane Michael in the Gulf region. We just pray for those people, Lord, that you would minister your encouragement to their hearts, that you would send people, ministries, churches, organizations, uh, that will benefit them and bless them and minister to them. And may you just help people who have lost so much to find you in the midst of their devastation. And we just lift them up to you, Lord. Thank you for this time and your word together today. We love you. We give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, if you, if you Google it, you will find countless TV shows and movies, past and present, that have to do with time travel, uh, either traveling in the past or time travel in the future. It is something that seems to fascinate us, this idea of defying time. Uh, NBC recently canceled their television show called Timeless that was all about you going back in time. Uh, the original Planet of the Apes movie in 1968 was about astronauts who thought they were going to another planet only to discover at the end of the film that they'd actually traveled forward in time on Earth, a time when apes ruled the world. Back in the day when I was a young buck, the time travel movie series was Back to the Future. How many of you remember Back to the Future? Okay, classic stuff. So if you love the theme of time travel, then you ought to love the Bible because it, it gives us glimpses backward and forward. It takes us back in time 
and it also takes us into the future. And Isaiah concludes his book here in chapter 65 and 66 with a glimpse way into the future, that he is shown by God a time beyond even our own day. And he prophesies about it here in these closing chapters. And some of the stuff we just read are examples of things related to the future, the coming age. He prophesies here about a time when all people will be living in peace, no war, no conflict. He talks about here, he prophesies about a time even when the animal kingdom will be tame. He talks about a time when people will live long and the sound of joy and and laughter will fill the streets instead of weeping and crying. He speaks prophetically about a time of blessing and prosperity, about a time when Jerusalem will be the capital city of the world. Isaiah is prophesying about a time that is known as the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ. After Jesus returns to the earth, to the earth here for his second coming, he will establish his kingdom on earth for a thousand years, and after that, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, where we will be with the Lord forever. And so Isaiah is traveling in time here in these closing chapters, talking about things that are to come. Now, to kind of explain this a little bit better, I, I, I've prepared a graph for you, just kind of a timeline of events. This is actually a, a graph that I've used on many occasions when we talk about end time events and, and prophetic things that the Bible speaks of. But, you know, for those of you who love Bible prophecy, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, you, you delight in as Isaiah concludes the book of Isaiah here. So for us to understand the time period that he's talking about, first let me take you back to the time period of Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, which happened around 32 AD. When Christ dies on a cross, is buried after three days, rises from the dead, 40 days later ascends back into heaven, the Bible says Jesus is at the right hand of the Father even right now, and he will come again. But when Christ ascended back into heaven, it ushered in what is called the church age. We are presently living in the church age. The next event to happen on the timeline of events, according to Scripture prophetically, as it concerns the church and believers in Christ, is going to be the rapture of the church. Now, the rapture of the church is basically this. The Bible says there's a generation of Christians who will not experience death and that we will be taken up, we will be seized, we will be snatched from the earth. Believers in Christ, there's going to be this moment in time, we don't know when it is, but there's going to be the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's the rapture of the church. How many of you are looking forward to the rapture of the church? Okay, let's, the older I get, the more I'm looking forward to the rapture of Christ, okay? When I was younger, I, I was just like, Lord, please, I want to get married. I want to have kids. Don't come yet. Okay, been there, done that. I'm ready for the rapture. So the, so the church is going to be a generation where Christians are, are literally snatched from the earth. Why? Because God's protecting us from the next event that's going to happen in the world. The Bible says seven years of tribulation. There's going to be cataclysmic world events that are going to happen unparalleled in human history across the landscape of the earth. Revelation 6 to 18 describes all of the things that happen, and it is God's final wake-up call to try to get the attention of non-believers, because everybody left on the earth at this point, at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, will all be non-believers. The Christians, the church, they've all been taken up to heaven. So those who have already died in Christ and those who are taken up by the rapture All Christians are in heaven now, at least for the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. People will come, will be able to come to know Christ during the seven years of tribulation. It's just going to be a lot more difficult because the world is going to be so crazy that the Bible says in Revelation, people will raise their fists to heaven and curse God. So people can still get saved, but for the time being here, there's a seven-year period of tribulation. The church is absent okay? And then at the end of the tribulation is the battle of Armageddon. Even people who aren't Christians and don't go to church have heard about the battle of Armageddon. When all these nations converge against Israel in an attempt to really fight God, and when that happens, Jesus Christ returns to the earth, and He, and he is victorious over all the enemies of Israel and of God who make war in the battle of Armageddon, and He establishes His kingdom. Then He brings all the saints back with Him, Christians who have died and been taken up in the rapture, they come back to earth with Jesus, and then that ushers in this millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years. 
Christ rules and reigns on earth. It's a time otherwise known as the kingdom age. And then after the thousand years, there's a new heaven and a new earth, the Bible says, and we shall be with him forever. Yeah, one guy's happy about it, yeah. (laughs) The millennial reign of Christ is what Isaiah's writing about here. So when you're reading your Bibles, I needed to take you through all this because otherwise when you read some of this language, you're going to look at this and you're going to go, what what is all this talking about here? Now, you might want to know, and this is a fair question, if all these things Isaiah is writing about here in the closing chapters has to do with way in the future, even beyond our own day, because we're somewhere here, I think we're we're pretty close to here, but we're somewhere in the church age, next thing to happen is the rapture, it could happen at any time. Okay, there's not another Bible prophecy that has to occur prior to the church being raptured. Okay, it could happen in the middle of the sermon and Jesus could finish it and do a whole lot better than I'm doing, all right? So it could happen at any time. But why in the world, if Isaiah's writing about this time period here, what benefit does it have to the people of his day? He's writing in the 700s BC. He's looking at a time way forward. What benefit does it have? What value does it have to the people of his own day? They're not even going to experience the fulfillment of these things. Well, the fact of the matter is, even in our own lifetime, we might not experience the rapture of the church before we die. Nobody knows when the rapture is going to happen. And if somebody tells you that they know, they're a false prophet. Because no man knows the day nor the hour, not even the sun. That is exclusively reserved for, in, in terms of knowledge to God the Father himself. So we don't know when these things are going to transpire, and for all we know, we might die in our lifetime, uh, and and these things that he prophesies, you know, it's still in the future for us. What value does it have? Well, the, the truth is that, again, even in our own lifetime, these things may not transpire. But yet, what God has done in the course of the Bible throughout human history is to explain these things in glimpses for the benefit of all generations throughout the course of time. It's as if God pulls back the curtain a little bit and says, now, I want you to see some of these things because I want you to know what is to come for those who know me. And I want you to have the hope of a future. And I want you to see these things that shall transpire in advance of their happening. And so God gives us previews into these things. We might have hope. This is the coming hope. This is the blessed assurance of the church that we will be with the Lord forever. We will rule and reign with Him, and we will spend eternity with Him. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man what God has prepared for them who love Him. There's some things that are unimaginable for us, and yet God gives us little glimpses at a time. And this is one section of it here in Isaiah 65. And by the way, when Paul writes that in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered the heart of man what God has prepared, he's quoting Scripture because he even starts that verse by saying, as it is written. You know who he's quoting? Isaiah. Isaiah 64, verse 4. That's when Isaiah would even say the similar thing. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. God has prepared unimaginable things for his children. And he shows us from time to time little glimpses. Now, this is what I want you to understand about what is to come. Now, there is an added value, though, for the people of Isaiah's day, even though Isaiah was writing about future events that would not be fulfilled in his lifetime. And here's the value. Most Old Testament Bible prophets, when they would prophesy, they were just being obedient to write or to say what God told them to write or say. But they didn't really understand necessarily, we we don't have any evidence that they understood when these things would be fulfilled or how. And what we come to understand when we have the benefit of looking backwards and looking at Old Testament prophets is that most Old Testament prophecy had a dual application. That most Old Testament prophecies have a near interpretation and a far interpretation. That a lot of times when these prophets would speak of something, it, it had dual, dual meaning. That there were some things in the near term that it applied to, and there were some things in the distant term that it applied to. For example, those of you who love this kind of thing, uh, Daniel chapter 12. The prophet Daniel in the 500s BC wrote about a time when he saw what he wrote as the abomination that causes desolation. 
He writes it in Daniel chapter 12, the abomination that causes desolation. About 400 years after he wrote that, in 164 BC, it will be fulfilled, at least in the near term. In 164 BC, a guy, a Greek king by the name of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, Epiphanes was a title he gave himself. Epiphanes translates God manifest. Wow. Can you imagine giving yourself that title? Anyway, he did. Pretty blasphemous. But anyway, so Antiochus IV Epiphanes comes into Jerusalem leading an army, overtakes the city, devastates the temple, and purposely, purposely slaughters a pig on the altar of the temple of God. He knew it was an unclean animal. He knew the Jews would be defiled, but it was his way of laying claim to the temple of God. Slaughters a pig on the altar. That happened 164 B.C. Bible scholars say that was the near fulfillment of when Isaiah said there's going to be a ruler who comes into Jerusalem, devastates the temple, and does something so vile that it is the abomination that causes desolation, 164 B.C. And yet when Jesus was on earth during the time of his ministry, in Matthew chapter 24, he quotes from Daniel 12. And he speaks about the abomination that causes desolation as something in the future. 164 B.C. was Antiochus IV Epiphanes. But Jesus takes the abomination that causes desolation. He says, that is something that happens to be in the future. He says, when you see in the temple the abomination that causes desolation, I want you to flee to the, temple, to the hills. Run for your lives. And what Jesus was speaking of prophetically, and the far interpretation of Daniel was the abomination that causes desolation is when the Antichrist comes. The Antichrist, still in our future, still to come, the Antichrist will set himself up in God's temple, 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes this, and he will proclaim himself to be God. That is the abomination that causes desolation. Okay, so many prophets, when they would prophesy, there was a near interpretation, there was a distant interpretation. When Isaiah writes here in chapter 65 and 66, listen, he says to the Jewish people, there's going to be a day of blessing and prosperity in Jerusalem. And there's going to be a time when laughter and joy will replace weeping and crying in the streets. The near interpretation of that was after the Jews would serve 70 years in Babylon, punishment for their rebellion and idolatry against God, God would bring the Jewish people back from Babylon after 70 years and return them to Jerusalem. And in that day, there would be blessing and prosperity, joy and laughter will fill the streets instead of weeping and crying. So when Isaiah writes in the 700s about a future day like this, the near interpretation is, okay, when they get back from Babylon and they experience their seven years of captivity, when they return, life will be better than when they left. True. But this language can't only refer to the return after Babylonian captivity because, notice in your Bibles again in chapter 65, verse 20, things like, he who dies at 100 will be thought a mere youth. What's all that about? And in verse 25, at the end of the chapter, he talks about the wolf and the lamb will feed together and they will neither harm nor destroy. So these things are pointing to a unique day, a unique time that we haven't experienced yet. Thus, the far interpretation of Isaiah is about the millennial reign of Christ. There are unique aspects and elements of life on earth that cannot be explained other than He's talking about the millennial period of time, the thousand years when Christ rules and reigns from Jerusalem on earth and Christians rule and reign with him. So it's going to be a wonderful time. You talk about peace and prosperity and joy and laughter. All of this is going to happen when Christ returns, establishes his kingdom on earth for a thousand years, and then after that, a new heaven and a new earth, and so shall we be with the Lord forever. Now here's your chance instead of just one guy. Is anybody looking forward to that? <laughs> Amen. So I want us to look at a few things this morning, five quickly, five marks of the millennium. What will life be like in the millennial reign? Because God's saying this to us because he wants to prepare us. This is what's in store for you who know the Lord. This is the future, so be prepared. Five marks of the millennium. Now, even before I start to enumerate this, let me go back to the, to the time slide. Oh, hold on, hold on, I'm using the wrong arrow. Here we go. I want everybody to understand, people who come into the millennial reign, there will be two types of people who come into this thousand-year period. 
One group of people will be all the saints who've died anywhere on this timeline prior to the second coming of Christ to the earth. Christians who die will go to heaven, and those Christians now will come back to earth with Jesus. Okay, the Bible says we get our glorified body just like Jesus has. Anybody looking forward to a glorified body? All right, yeah. It'll be a whole lot better than one you have. So, you know, and, and don't worry about gluten or anything. It'll be wonderful. <laughs> so saints who are with the Lord in heaven come back in their glorified body with Jesus, and we are a part of the millennial kingdom as, listen to this, Revelation 20 verse 6 says, believers who return with Christ will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So Christians will help Jesus Jesus ruling from Jerusalem, capital city of the world, believers will be helping Jesus to govern and manage the world as, as his saints, okay? And, and he will assign territories for, now, I, but I just want to let you know in advance, Jesus has already told me I have Bermuda, so <laughs> get your own. <laughs> I think Cleveland is available if you want that, but anyway. <laughs> And so we're going to have different territories in the world. We're going to help to manage and administrate God's kingdom literally on earth. Okay, so that's one group of people. But there's another group of people, people who survive the tribulation period. Okay, now, now most saints will be martyred. Most Christians who come to faith during the seven years of tribulation will be martyred, and they will end up going to heaven, okay? And then they come back with Jesus with the rest of us. But there will be a whole number of people who, who find faith in Christ during the tribulation period, who, who manage to escape being martyred, and they will enter into the millennium with Christ. And so when Isaiah writes here some of these different marks of the millennium, he's going to primarily be talking about these people who live, who move into the millennial period. They're going to be living regular lives in regular natural physical bodies, being regular people. Who, and, and life in many ways, so here's, here's the first thing, it will be, there will be a similarity to life now in many ways. Because these people are going to be doing life very much like life is now. They will, they will marry, they will have families, they will build homes, they will work jobs, they'll play sports, they'll go on vacation, they'll worship the Lord, just like we do now. And if you look there in your Bibles, in chapter 65, verse 21, it says, they will, they will build houses and dwell in them, they will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Uh, it talks in verse 23, they will not toil in vain or bear children doomed to misfortune, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. So that population that manages to survive the tribulation who are in Christ will, will be ushered into that millennial period, and they will be living lives very similar to how life is now, very similar to how life is now. But then Isaiah says, but there are a few things here that are going to be very different from the way the world is now. And the next thing is the list is uh, there will be longevity. People will live long lives. In verse 20 there, he says, never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. See, it, see in the millennium, a hundred is the new 30. You, you, you died a hundred, you're going to be thought, man, that guy was really young when he died. I mean, I want you to imagine, life in the millennial kid, very similar to how it is now, but people are going to live a lot longer. You're going to have guys in the NFL in their 80s. You're going to have couples having babies in their 90s. That didn't excite some of you, did it? But life, see, the reason that you think, well, that's sick, that's because, that's because in your head you're thinking, hey, let's have a baby, but it's not going to be like that. It's not going to be, hey, you're not going to be like that, okay? People are going to live a lot longer, and, and so they're going to live perhaps hundreds of years because to die at 100, you're going to be thought to be dying at, in your youth. Listen, in the book of Genesis, you, you look at the, at the first many generations in the book of Genesis, people lived hundreds of years. Adam was 930 years. Noah was 950, okay, when he died. You see, long life pre-flood, after the flood, the Genesis flood, then the lifespan of human beings begins to decline rapidly. Because Noah, pre-flood and, and 
in the middle of the flood, he, he lives to be 950. After the flood, Abraham lives to be 175, and which is still a long life to us. But at that point, the, the lifespan of humanity begins to decline precipitously until it begins to flatline and level off. And the one psalm that Moses wrote in the book of Psalms, Psalm 90, verse 10, Moses says that the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. And Moses lived to be 120, but yet he still even knew, he understood, as God put it on his heart, that the average lifespan, lifespan of man will be 70 years, maybe 80 if he has the strength. And that's true for us today. What Moses wrote 3,400 years ago in Psalm 90, verse 10, is statistically true for us today. The average lifespan of an American today is 78 years of age. That's the average lifespan. You ladies outlive men by five years, 71 to, uh, sorry, 81 on average to 76. That's why you bump the average for us to 78. But um, the, the, that's the average lifespan of people. And it seems that in the millennium, we return to a pre-flood longevity where people will live very long lives, something is biologically and genetically restored to allow for long life. Very interesting days to come. Number three, we also see that in the millennium it'll be a time of prosperity. In chapter 66, 12, it says, for this is what the Lord says, I will extend peace to her like a river and the wealth of nations like a flooding stream. And also, I put the verse, the reference up on the screen for you, in Isaiah 60, which is also a, a passage about the millennium, in verse 5, Isaiah says, then you will look and be radiant, your heart will throb and swell with joy, the wealth on the seas will be brought to you, to you the riches of the nations will come. Now, a little clarification, it doesn't mean that everybody's, you know, going to be driving, you know, a, a rolls and, you know, living high in a hog. What it means specifically is in reference to the economic prosperity of Israel. But it appears, though, overall, in general, that during the millennial period, there will be spiritual, physical, and material prosperity. I mean, you have to begin to imagine the world where Jesus is the single king of the, war, of the earth, ruling from Jerusalem. And by the way, we don't have time to talk about all the other aspects of the millennial kingdom, but for those of you who know your Bibles, Satan is bound for this thousand years too. So you got, yeah, woohoo to that, amen. So you got, so you got, uh, you, we got one guy excited to go to heaven and, and one person excited about Satan being bound for a thousand years. But you got Jesus as king on the throne and you got Satan bound. I mean, what is life going to be like? It's going to be a time of great blessing and prosperity and, you know, no, no, um, you know, no economic downturn, no adjustment in, in the stock market. I mean, it's just going to be clearly a, a very prosperous and blessed time. There's no mention in the Bible of, of poor people in the millennium kingdom. There's no class warfare. There, there's no um, uh, forgotten or forsaken class of people. It just seems that everyone is working hard and doing well under King Jesus. So it'll be a time of uh, similarity, longevity, uh, number three, prosperity. Number four, it'll also be a time of security. In 65 verse 22. He says, no longer will they build houses and others live in them. See, that's the idea of some invading army coming and confiscating your stuff. He says, or, or plant and others eat. Okay. In other words, in the millennial period, they, people will not be threatened in that day. They won't build houses that others will occupy or plant vineyards that other people are going to come and confiscate from you because there's no fear of attack, there's no invasion, there's no war. Now, at the end of the thousand years, there's other details about a final war, but during this thousand years, there's, there's no war, there's no conflict, there's no terrorism because there is a new sense of security in the world. In fact, it's interesting to note, for you note-takers, you can just write down in the margin of your Bible there, Isaiah 2, verse 4. Back in Isaiah 2, Isaiah also saw the millennial day, and he said, listen, in that day, people will be beating their swords into plowshares, because you won't, you won't need to take up arms. There will not be any need for fighting, and so people will take their useless swords that otherwise would be used for warfare, and they will beat them into plowshares, might as well take the metal that are used in swords to make plowshares because people are going to be plowing their fields. It's going to be a fruitful time, but you won't need to be fighting. So a time of great security. 
And then lastly, number five, also a time of great tranquility. Because you see, when the, pre, when the Prince of Peace comes, he will usher in a peace like we've never known. And even the animal kingdom will be tame. And that's the way that Isaiah concludes chapter 65 when he talks about here, look at verse 25, the wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like the ox, but dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Animals will become docile and domesticated and, and it, it's just a, an unimaginable world. Um, by the way, nowhere in the Bible does it say that the lion will lie down with the lamb. That makes for great artwork, but nowhere in the Bible does it say that. What it says in the Bible is it speaks about the wolf together with the lamb. Now, it intimate, the Bible intimates the picture of the lion and the lamb because when Jesus rules, there's ultimate peace and it affects even the animal kingdom. But specifically, the Bible never says the lion lies down with the lamb. What this verse talks about is the wolf and the lamb and the lion eating straw and, 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 and there will not be any, any ferocious animals. I, I want us to try to imagine this. I mean, try to imagine a world where you can swim with sharks and crocodiles uh, without any fear, any harm, you know, where, where every zoo becomes a pet -a pet farm. You know, you don't need any cages anymore because every animal is tame. Try to imagine a world where... where uh, Every dog doesn't bite, and every cat is no longer demon-possessed. Try to imagine that. <laughs> I'm not even sure about the last point there, but I'm just, you know, <laughs> try to imagine. Um, and it's interesting because Isaiah even says similar things back in chapter 11. You don't need to turn there, but listen to what he writes in chapter 11, verse 6 to 8, about the same stuff. He says, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. I'm reading from Isaiah 11. This is verse 7 now. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant, listen to this. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand in the viper's nest. Can you imagine a world like that, where mom and dad look to their kids and say, listen, you've been on video games all day long. Please go outside and play with cobras. Would you please get outside? You need a little vitamin D. By the way, feed the lions too. They're hungry. Would you? I mean, that's the way the world's going to be. This again, it seems to be like an unimaginable thing, but I love the way that at different places in the Bible, and this is one of them, God pulls back the curtain a little bit. And Isaiah said it, and Paul quotes it, and I mentioned it earlier. No eye has seen, and no ear has heard, and neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. That God has a plan and a purpose through Jesus Christ, his son, for all who would believe and receive him. There is a future, there is a hope, there is a millennial kingdom, there is a new heaven, there is a new earth, and to those who love him, we shall be with him forever and ever and ever. Amen and amen. Praise his name. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the hope that we have when we read Scripture and we get a glimpse of these things that are to come. And we thank you that you would use the pen of Isaiah to write these things. And when we consider a world of just complete peace with you reigning, we consider a world that is blessed and prosperous, where joy and laughter fill the streets instead of crying and weeping and murder and assault and wickedness. It's unimaginable to us, a world where even the animal kingdom is at peace because the Prince of Peace is on the throne, ruling and reigning the earth from Jerusalem. Lord, our hearts anticipate a glorious day, and we are so grateful that you would offer us a glimpse into these things that are to come. Lord, for us who know you, for us who have surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ, there is a future and a hope for us. And I pray, Lord, that everybody listening to this Bible study would come to a place of surrender in their lives 
acknowledging Jesus, accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior, so that these, these people too can rejoice with the rest of us. That there is a day in store for us that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, that we can't even imagine what you have prepared for us who love you. And we thank you, Lord. We give you glory, praise, and honor. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen and amen.